So let's move on to uh, specialized cores on demand. So uh, this this is I I want to talk about this is workloads, not as necessarily hardware, but the, uh, this this portion of it is actually going to be where we're going to talk about GPUs. Mm -hmm. So um, what are some of the graphics applications for GPUs? Actually, uh, one of my friends who lives 40 miles south of here is one of the guys who ran the Lunar Orbiter Image Restoration Project. And so just in, in talking to him and, and reading some of the material, when we were first planning on doing uh, lunar landings, they they sent a probe up that actually circled the moon and sent back images, and uh, they sent back images as as um, digital data at that point. Uh, and this stuff was stored on racks and racks of tapes, and this guy, about 10 years ago now, went through the process of actually putting together hardware to read these tapes to recover these images. Uh, when they were looking for landing sites, they actually only decoded the portions of the images that they thought would be interesting. And the way that they actually examined these is they rented out churches and hung out huge sheets in the front of them and projected things from the back of it so they could actually get the resolution to be able to look at, to be able to figure out <laughs> where was a suitable landing site. This was the way that they did, they, they, you know, they didn't have the ability to zoom in on these things like we do today. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the fact that you can uh, you know, take Google Earth and, and zoom in from the, the Earth being the size of a pinhead down to an ant walking on the sidewalk gives you some rough idea of how far we've come in 50 years. So uh, anyway, he was uh, an interesting guy. Anyway, there's lots of, well, he is an interesting guy, uh, done lots of things, and it, it, just a fun guy to talk to. Uh, there's uh, lots of graphics applications for GPU. Probably the, the most common one that comes to mind are um, oil and gas and mining, where they actually do lots of seismic uh, um, sonic images to, to be able to see what's going on underneath the ground. How many people have seen Jurassic Park where they're using the, the thing at the beginning where they were using shotgun shells to send shock waves down to fund... They, they do the same basic thing in the oil industry where they actually are looking at these images. And the only way that they can actually figure out whether there's oil or gas or, or other valuable minerals down there is that they need to be able to look at these things in great detail and need to blow them up in great scale. So there's lots, so they actually have a lot of graphics used in these industries to be able to look at things very carefully. Of course, there's like CAD CAM, which is the ability to actually design uh, objects, typically machines and be able to look at them in very fine detail and be able to you know, draw things within the, the um, thousands or uh, millionths of an inch that you actually need to be able to machine an awful lot of these th things to be able to see what's going on. Uh, there's the medical industry. So the medical industry is huge on uh, being able to you know, look at MRIs in very fine detail because it's, they, they need to be able to blow these things up and, and look at them and be able to see them and in fact, the medical industry states that you, the lowest resolution image that they actually want to deal with is a 6K image. So, uh, you know, one and a half times the resolution of your 4K screen these days. Uh, anybody who's interested, you can stop by our booth. Later on, we actually have uh, some medical imagery stuff where we actually have a 4K screen up high and then we have an 8K screen down lower where you can actually see the resolution difference between the two of them and if you thought 4K was nice, take a look at 8K. It's, it's amazing. Anyway, the, the medical industry is one of the huge uses of GPUs. Uh, of course, the entertainment industry. So uh, NetApp actually has done a lot of collaboration with DreamWorks, and GPUs are the only way that you can actually render an awful lot of these things in any reasonable amount of time. Uh, I remember talking to some friends about 10 years ago who were doing cartoons, and they would talk about, you know, kicking off the rendering machine for a weekend to be able to render this, th these things to be able to, you know, put together a five-minute cartoon. And today, they actually do it in just about real time, and the way they do it in real time is with GPUs. And, of course, there's the gaming industry. Uh, the gaming industry is pretty much what leads just about everything. There's... I could have mentioned the porn industry as well, but it's, uh, I'll, I'll just stick with the gaming industry is what's driving the high resolution graphics. Uh, so these are, these are like a lot of the graphical uh, uses for GPUs. 
Um, one of the things that uh, VMware has done now with VDI, with VDI is the ability to actually uh, get rid of the, the heavyweight processing that we have over here, way on the left side of the screen, and uh, yank that all into the, the hypervisor and actually make use of the GPUs and then dis uh, remotely display that over the two primary protocols are TGX or PCIOP. So that is, that's currently the way we do that. The stuff that we're actually showing in our booth is running out of uh, a little NetApp HCI system on wheels, running in the corner of my garage, and we're actually displaying it in the booth downstairs. So it's all coming over TGX. There is no high, process, high powered process, uh, graphics <coughs> processors in our booth. It's just a normal PC that has two uh, 4K ports. That's how you get AKs. You actually bond two 4K ports together. And it's all being run in my place. And you can actually sit around there and play around with these medical images, roll them over, add skin to them, whatever you want to do to them. And it's a, a kind of fun experiment. And it's all happening real time in my garage. Mm. Uh, so, in addition to doing things like graphics, uh, you can actually, GPUs are actually get used an awful lot for uh, inference, AI, whatever you want to call it. The, the names are not entirely synonymous, but they're typically used synonymously. So, there's two different cores that you end up with in GPUs these days. There's, a, there's what's called a CUDA core, and a CUDA core is basically very good at doing a multiply and accumulate operation. So this would be uh, you multiply and add something, you multiply something by something else and add it onto an accumulator. And this, I, I don't know the, I can't explain to you the mathematical formula, but this is very handy for doing graphics. You, when you're rendering graphics, being able to do this in a single CPU cycle, when you have your GPU running at 1.6 gigahertz, is very fast, and that's how we actually end up with the graphics. There's also a thing called a tensor core. So a tensor core actually will do a vector multiplication and accumulate in a single clock cycle. And again, I don't know the math behind it, but for some reason, uh, AI and inference makes much better use of the tensor cores. So the ability to do, actually do vector multiplication and accumulation in a single clock cycle. So the tensor cores typically are a little bit more expensive, a little bit harder to put together. They, they run just as fast because they're running on the same clock rate as the CUDA cores, but basically, Graphics likes the CUDA cores, and inference likes the, um, the tensor cores. <clears throat> and so, um, we actually, um, we have a customer, and, and other people have talked about this as well, where you, if you actually have a GPU, why not have it doing graphics during the day and have it doing AI at night? And this is actually one of the things that the oil industry does as well, oil and gas industry does as well. Um, I'll get into that in a minute. So. Uh, just a, a brief history of, of AI and ML. So artificial intelligence is not a new concept. Uh, we've been having uh, systems that can play checkers and chess and whatever since the 50s. Uh, you know, the, the idea that there's actually a computer game that you can play against that isn't just a game of chance. I mean, playing solitaire doesn't mean that the computer is outsmarting you when you don't lose it, when you don't win solitaire, just as a game of chance. But having a computer outsmart you at checkers or chess, that actually is a a little bit more of a, a, you know, the computer has to learn something to be able to do this for you. Um, machine learning is the idea that you, uh, you, go, you can go a little bit beyond this, and it's not just a matter of the computer making inferences and, and having, working from a set of data, but the machines can actually go off and gather information on their own and attempt to draw correlations and inferences from this and be able to come up with uh, conclusions that a, a person might not have been able to come up with in the same amount of time. And then the, the deep learning is the next progression of this where you, you actually can go off and, and look for things that uh, you know, a human might never have found. You, you basically can comb through data and, and come up with inferences, relationships, this type of thing that there's absolutely no way a person would have ever figured out. So what, what do we actually call AI? So there's the idea of like perception categorization, the idea that you can look at something and say, that's a mirror. That's Justin, uh, and and be able to you know see what's what's going on around you. Um, there's the the idea. There's um, there's you know context and relationship. It's like if you stand at the right angle, I can probably see Justin's reflection in the mirror. 
So it's like I can't see it right now, but I just know from my from the way mirrors work and the way that I've experienced in my life that you know I will I would be able to see that. Uh, there's prediction for cause and effect. It, it's like I am I'm fairly certain that uh, Justin would show up because I don't think that he's actually a vampire, and and you know that's that's actually uh, and if he didn't show up. My prediction for that cause and effect would be that Justin is a vampire. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're a vampire, Justin. <laughs> so am I. <laughs> no, he just sucks. And, oh. uh, and I guess that if, if we're, we're going to continue this analogy for the planning and decision making, um, it, it's, uh, if, uh, if Justin was a vampire, I probably wouldn't want to stick around real close. And I, I might actually be all out at the little farmer's market downstairs buying some garlic. So in reality, <laughs> computers are very good at perception and categorization. They're actually probably better than humans. Well, they, not, not they probably are. They are better than humans for certain types of perception and categorization. In reality, they suck at all the others compared to human intelligence. There's absolutely no way that you, it, it would be very hard for a computer to figure out that Justin was going to appear in the mirror just by looking at this room. It'd be very hard to figure out that you know, if Justin didn't fail, appear in that mirror, that he was a vampire, and uh, the computer would probably need to go watch way too many vampire movies to figure out that they needed to go get garlic if he was. <laughs> and again, I'm sorry for picking on you, Justin. <laughs> <laughs> um, but perception and categorization, they don't do this all by themselves. So it's... Uh, they, they actually need some decent information to work from. So this is a, a little tiny NVIDIA Jetson uh, Nano inference card. <coughs> and they're about 100 bucks. They're basically a little tiny standalone GPU-based computer. And you can do all sorts of inference, inference things on, with them. And one of the early projects that you can do is facial recognition. Of course, for facial recognition, you actually need a decent amount of data to figure out what's going on. So in this one, <laughs> NVIDIA's inference engine figured out that I was an Arabian, that there was a, a best chance I was an Arabian camel. <laughs> Crutch. <laughs> and somebody else did this. I didn't actually have, I, I didn't actually do this myself, but I feared that what were the chances that this would show up? What, what would this show? And I don't actually have the real answer, but if AI was capable of not only doing the, the uh, um, recognition and categorization, but all the other aspects, this is probably what the result would be. <laughs> uh, another example that I had heard about along these same lines is uh, the medical industry was actually trying to uh, use this type of recognition to figure out, to detect hip fractures. And so they fed a lot of information in about the hip fractures. And uh, what they didn't realize was an un, unexpected side effect in that the, the categorization wasn't just looking at the photo, it was also looking at the metadata. And so it turned out that it was coming up with an awful lot of false positives from portable x-ray machines because an awful lot of the data that was initially fed where they did have hip fractures was from portable x-ray machines because lots of times when you have a hip fracture, it's an old person who fell down at home and the, EM, the EMTs on the scene took a, a portable x-ray to see if there was a hip fracture. And so the data they fit in, all of a sudden the, the machine learning said, hey, this thing came from a portable x-ray machine. There's a good chance it's a hip fracture rather than actually looking at the picture <laughs> and, and figuring it out. Uh, so, I mean, there's all sorts of other reasons for using inference machines. I mean, we, of course, do cryptocurrency mining that way, right? No, that's not what we're here to talk about. Uh, again, oil and gas. So oil and gas, there's an awful lot of, uh, of um, inference work with, uh, with GPUs simply because they have data from decades ago that they, they went over with the best techniques they had decades ago to go over that data. But if they have these GPU-enabled systems, why not rerun that stuff and see if there's something that was missed because it was just looked at by human eyes or much less intelligent processes 
back then. So lots of times they have reams and reams of this data that would be, well, reams and reams, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> gigabytes and gigabytes of this data that they, they have stored away and it would be very difficult data to recreate because it's a matter of going out and doing these uh, seismic soundings. And so why not just pour over it with the, the AI capabilities that are out there today? Uh, one of the more interesting cases that I first heard about is uh, about 10, year ago, 10 years ago, my home state of Nevada uh, started doing facial recognition on driver's licenses. And they turned up quite a few people who had actually gone off and gotten duplicate licenses. So they, just through running facial recognition on driver's licenses, they figured out that these people were trying to get duplicate licenses. And lots of times they, you know, some of the stories back in time, people were trying to get duplicate licenses because they didn't need work and they had a conviction on the record, so they came up with some fake name to use. Uh, other reasons were more fraudulent than that, uh, typically identity theft mm -hmm. as well. But I mean, that was, that was kind of an interesting use that I was kind of surprised that uh, you know, my, my backwater second only to Louisiana and being backward state was able to do. <laughs> uh, so, uh, a childhood friend of mine actually went on to find a company named Keyhole Systems that got purchased as Google Earth. So, uh, I was talking to him a few months ago and uh, he actually talked about one of the things that they would try to do with Google Maps. And initially, Google Maps would interpolate addresses. So it would say, if your address is 450 uh, Market Street, there's a good chance you're about halfway between 4th and 5th on Market Street. And like, this isn't very good, this isn't very good because lots of times the numbers don't run contiguously. They're, they're you know, not proportional. So he actually said, let's actually try to you know, go off and look at what street addresses are and come up with a better way of doing this. So they have their street view cars that run around and they were taking pictures of everything. So it's like, okay, we, can, we should be able to gather the street address information from here. The problem is that it was very difficult to actually pick out what the, the street addresses were from the street view because they're all over the place. Sometimes they're on a post, sometimes they're on the street, sometimes they're uh, up on the curb, sometimes they're angled. It, it's, it, you can't just you know, have a machine look at something and say, oh, the street address is this. How many people remember CAPTCHAs where they, you were asked to enter the street address? So cat, that CAPTCHA was actually feeding mm -hmm. inference information in to Google Maps to be able to p figure out how to pick out street addresses. Mm -hmm. So they were taking the information that you were providing through your CAPTCHA and feeding that into their inference engine in an effort to come up where the actual addresses were on Google Maps. So what do you think they're doing now when they tell you uh, where's a stop sign or where's a stoplight mm -hmm. or where's a parked car in this picture? Mm -hmm. They're actually using that to figure out autonomous driving uh, algorithms as well. So he actually talked some about all, uh, autonomous driving as well. And it was, it was kind of interesting because they, um, they tried to lump things together that, uh, that might be interesting things when they're figuring it out. And it's like, uh, you know, it, it becomes difficult when you actually try to, like, say there's a mother and child walking down, well, do you lump that as one thing or two things? And, you know, if you think it's going to move, is it going to move in one, as one thing or not one thing? And uh, it's also a matter of, like, um, you figure out if it's, if it's a car, you know, there's, if there's a car that's moving at you, there's a very small chance that car is going to all of a sudden start moving sideways, as opposed to a human where it's, that person could move in any direction. So this is some of the stuff they need to figure out with autonomous driving mm. as well. And my final example here uh, is actually one that came from NVIDIA and Palo Alto Networks as well. Uh, there's an ass load of railroad tracks in Australia. And that is the technical term. Yes, it is. Yeah, exactly. I, I believe it's actually a metric ass load because yes. yeah. it's, it's Australia. They use the metric system, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they don't call it a quarter pounder with cheese. <laughs> um, so lots of this is spread across very barren parts of Australia. And to do track maintenance, it used to be that somebody would have to go walk the tracks every few years. And can you imagine walking across Australia, checking railroad tracks? <coughs> well, 
they actually figured out that, hey, let's start off by taking aerial photography of this and being able and running this through some inference engines and looking for possible problems with the railroad tracks that, that way and seeing if there, we can potentially run and find problems before we actually have to make somebody walk the tracks. And the next thing they did is they took a Jetson, I'm not sure if it was a Nano or something else, they put it on a drone and they started flying the Jetson uh, over the tracks on the drone and seeing if they could pick out other defects very quickly because it's you didn't want to actually have to cloud process all of this stuff. You wanted to be able to have the drone fly along and stop or, or slow down if there's a potential mm. problem. They did actually, they were actually feeding the drone with some of the information they got from the aerial photography. Anyway, uh, as I said, Palo Alto Networks and NVIDIA worked together on an awful lot of that stuff. Unfortunately, NetApp has nothing to do with that. <laughs> Um, anyway, th that's a bunch of different uh, AI stories, and I could come up with a handful of others. I'm sure like everybody hears new AI stories, new inference th stories every day, and most of that stuff is being driven by this type of technology. So how, how are we actually using it in the data center now? Well, if we get back to our VMware old roots here, there's actually three different ways that VMware will allow you to use uh, GPUs. So there's direct, there's the, the you know one user, one, one GPU, so uh, VMware doesn't really play a part in this at all. VMware has what's called shared direct. So if the GPU has some concept of how to share itself, VMware will say, hey, this GPU understands how to share itself and will give these, this many users a share of how to do it. And the third version is that uh, whether the GPU knows how to share itself or not, ESX can say, we're going to lump all of the resources together and then I'm going to virtualize it across the various different users that want to use it. And it's the exact same setup for both uh, CUDA and Tensor Cores on the GPUs. Um, uh, and it, it doesn't matter. It's, I mean, various different GPUs have various different types of cores involved and in, incorporated in them. So uh, I believe that's my talk on GPUs and video and, and inference. Questions, comments? Are you, are you seeing people uh, adapting TPUs inside the data center? Like, I, I use my home rigs, but those are dedicated Chinese-made TPUs. A, a TPU is a... It's a tensor. Pro it's, 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 yeah, no, no graphics as an option, just right. pure tensor. Um, I mean, I believe that's what this is. Uh, and I don't... <clears throat> I don't have adoption numbers for anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I, yeah, just like anecdotal, if you knew of any kind of thing. But I, mainly you see GPU more likely and TPU done, so, done in rigs like that. So anecdotally, I know of a couple customers who are making use <coughs> of both. I do not know of any that are actually making use of tensor only. Mm -hmm. 